and pass the baton to uh, to Chris. Thank you. If we could have the questions come up. Uh, basically, what I did is to uh, uh, clone uh, the question slides that were in Josh's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and these are the questions that uh, had emerged. Next slide. And these are more or less his answers. Uh, so I, I think he's uh, explained these. But I, the, 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 the points to emphasize are how do we really make the process better and faster? And that synergizes very closely with Dan's point of how do we make this a scalable environment? I mean, to what degree can we engage academic medical centers, or for that matter, uh, ac medical centers, academic or otherwise, uh, to have a very low barrier of entry uh, of, of, of sharing this? It, it really comes down to the big data sharing problem uh, that NIH is looking at very carefully, as we all know. Uh, but I, I think uh, Josh did hit on many of the issues. Uh, many of you who know me will know that uh, standards and extensible methods are my middle name uh, and the whole notion of uh, the, the EMR, which is an evolving target uh, culturally and, and uh, technically in most of our organizations, is actually having increasing capabilities. Next slide. I tried to synthesize um, uh, Dan's uh, question, so I, I this ultimate reductionist model, Dan, forgive me. Um, <laughs> So uh, we've already talked about what would it take to scale. And I was very intrigued uh, with uh, Dan's uh, mention of the Lego pieces, because of course this reflects uh, the clinical element uh, modeling world uh, and the whole clinical information modeling initiative that uh, Dan, uh, Stan Huff uh, is leading. Uh, and, and the creation, if you will, of modular data elements that can be aggregated into modular observations. So the notion of hypertension as a really computable observation as a component of more complex phenotypes or any permutations, as you said. And then, of course, you, you went into the decision support problem, and you explicitly included curly braces. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, at least in the decision support world, the old joke was uh, the, it, decision support is great as long as you can, as you can solve the curly braces problem, which means a miracle occurs here. Uh, you, you map uh, your own local organization's information to whatever the uh, author of that decision support rule had intended. And this was, of course, done through divine intervention. Um, so we, we have panelists that I don't want to overlook in, in this discussion that were named and designated. Uh, and those are, if, if, uh, if speakers, or if participants don't mind, we'll turn to the panelists first for further discussion and then open it to general discussion. Uh, they're Geraldo Heiss, Stan Huff, and Zach Kawane. So why don't we take them in that order? Geraldo, are, are you on the line? I am, and just unmuted myself. Thank you. Um, fascinating. Thank you. I want to perhaps point to one, many, many points, excellent points have been raised. Perhaps one that intrigues me in particular is the, um, the notion that at what point are we ready to cross the that, that uh, watershed between um, phenotype development uh, toward implementation in the sense of readiness um, as these um, algorithms have developed have been developed they have done a superb job in supporting um, association studies and discovery um, the at that point I think we have evidence that they do work and the, the group has done a superb job as we approach the, the question of implementation, in fact, aren't already jumping into it, um, what are the costs of um, failing to uh, appropriately optimize, say, predictive value or something like that? Is that sufficient to support uh, clinical decision making? Is it sufficient to support uh, reporting to participants and so, and so forth? In other words, what is the cost of uh, less than perfect <clears throat> validity when it comes to these uh, EHR-based, record-based uh, phenotypes that perform so well when it comes to association studies. It, it, it perhaps possibly reducing a little bit the the um, power, the statistical power at that level. But do they are they what what assurances do we have to have in place to move toward implementation and the next applications of these algorithms? Things that were approached in a very, very well in a general term, in, in a general sense, and that perhaps require a little more thought in terms of specificity. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, 
and some of this probably goes back to the previous previous discussion, but I and I actually have more questions than I have conclusions. Or uh, we're working in the, and and you know in terms of making a lot of these things actual practical and workable. For instance, the commercial labs that we're ordering our genetic tests from aren't set up to send back coded and structured data so that we can incorporate it in a computable form in our record. What we typically get back electronically is something that says deprinted a report, which gets faxed to us as a writ, you know, as an image document rather than even as a partial document. Uh, and I don't know. I don't know if you I think you should continue. Okay. Stand. Okay. okay. We'll ask others to mute until uh, Stan completes. And um, another part of that, again, just sort of practical plumbing kind of things are uh, improving our test ordering systems so that we get appropriate family history and historical data and clinical data available to the laboratories when they do the testing so that you get better testing. Um, and then another thing that I think is interesting to think about is, and you know, there's a motivation and, and there have been pre-agreement by this group about sharing of data. And when I get back to my own sort of state and institution, uh, it's clear that this kind of sharing of data is going to improve research and also going to improve um, uh, patient care. What's not clear, or it seems to be a problem in a sense, is even though that's true, the the local politics of competition between healthcare organizations and other things aren't conducive to people actually sharing data, even though it's, you know, at some level everybody understands it's best. And I wonder, again, what people have thought or seen or ways to create better incentives for people to actually do the data sharing within a community. And let's move to Zach if we can. Zach, are you there? Can we go to the last slide? Last slide. Yes. Um, I, I, this is my simplistic summary and points of emphasis. Uh, if we're, no, we can't, Zach. Um, <laughs> uh, I just saw your message pop up. Uh, but what degree of clinical normalization is needed, uh, and, and will meaningful use standards help us? Oh, there you are, Zach. Let, 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 me, let me just finish this, and then, then we'll let you continue. Uh, and then finally, culturally within an organization, if we're going to achieve the kinds of scalability and um, uh, low cost for phenotyping, organizations and medical centers, and this is starting to happen with accountable care organizations, thank heavens, need to think of clinical data as a primary resource, whereas right now it's almost a byproduct of the care process. Uh, and the concerns about comparability, consistency, or worse, any mode of reusability are, are second or third tier in the context of many organizations. But uh, Zach, carry on. Yes, well, first of all, amen to what you just said, brother. Um, <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And it, it actually dovetails exactly with what I, what, what I was going to say. So I think the point that was just made about the uh, laboratory vendors is valid, um, but it is dwarfed by the problem of, of um, the electronic health record system vendors are not particularly um, exercise to either represent the family history or uh, genomic data in the electronic health record systems. And I will not name the individuals in our group who reported that uh, their vendors, their commercial vendors, were now a couple years behind what they had promised uh, they would be, where they would be when they first sold them these systems with regard to um, um, genomics. But and here's my real point. My point is it comes back to us, and it comes back to um, Chris's point. 
if our clinical leadership does not make this genomic and genetic decision support part of their primary criteria for selecting electronic health record uh, systems, we will be waiting many, many years. And no matter what we do here in Emerge, we'll be working at the margins if our clinical leadership does not make that uh, selection uh, feature a primary selection uh, metric in choosing a vendor. And I think we just have to recognize that. Uh, without that, we will be working at the margins. All right. Thank you, Zach. So now we have time. Uh, we still have time, don't we? Yeah. yeah. For general discussion. Any any uh, comments uh, from panelists or presenters or anyone else? Yeah, this is uh, Mark Williams. A uh, uh, comment and, and uh, question. Uh, the a comment to, relates to clinical decision support, and I think uh, looking at Dan's uh, sort of five versions of this, I just wanted to let the uh, group know that there are actually some ongoing uh, uh, discussions in a couple of those areas. The info button project that you've already heard about, which would be a way to represent educational information related to genomics, uh, is uh, interacting with uh, the open info button standards group and others to uh, develop hopefully a generalizable solution that could represent genetic and genomic data. So that's number one. Number two is that the Clinical Decision Support Consortium, which uh, had been funded through AHRQ, uh, whose funding uh, ended last year, has been resurrected in the version 2.0 um, with Blackford Middleton, the original PI, uh, leading this effort. Uh, Blackford is now at Vanderbilt, and they have been very interested and have reached out to the Electronic Health Record Integration Group about using some of our eMERGE PGX uh, use cases and clinical decision support that we're building as exemplars uh, for their, uh, their work. So we do have some nascent efforts in that area. The question that I have comes back to the LEGO model, and um, I'm wondering if anyone has or if it would be possible to define a set of, you know, basic phenotypes uh, that we would agree could be assembled to answer some substantial proportion of clinical questions. If that is possible to do, then that could very clearly lay out uh, prioritization of phenotypes uh, that we would want to be able to do to, that would then allow the reassembly of the phenotypes in this modular way uh, to answer a ton of clinical questions. Peggy, you want to answer that, or, or, or just the mic? Yeah. Um, uh, with respect to the uh, modular uh, phenotypes, actually, Luke Rasmussen has a paper under review um, apropos of what you were saying, applying software design patterns to phenotype design patterns and showing that there are a finite number of re repeatable patterns that compose our phenotypes. So that suggests that the modularization is actually quite tractable. Um, the and just to, one other thing oh, I wanted to comment on was um, with respect to the phenotypes and uh, clinical application, one issue that we've run into a lot in eMERGE 1 and eMERGE 2 with respect to phenotypes is that the definite yeses and the definite noes are often a minority of the total patients. So Dan's comment about when do you collect more information, I think when we go to clinical applicability will be critically important. And figuring out how to structure those questions and how to build hooks into our EHRs so that our decision support, instead of being do this, becomes ask this, will be, I think, a huge step forward. Thank you. Hello? If you think about the number of um, phenotypes, there are certain phenotypes that have been reused and, and the entire data set has been labeled with, um, like diabetes, type 2 diabetes, um, BMI. Uh, uh, so there are some examples of that already in play that you could imagine being extended for sure. Uh, this is this is Reed Peretz. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, so there's a paper in this month's genomic, uh, Genetics and Medicine that uh, speaks to both phenotype ascertainment and uh, decision support. It's by Scott Gross and his group looking at um, uh, insurance data to identify individuals in large health systems that uh, have individual features of a pleiotropic condition, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. And by looking at uh, individuals who have more than one of the phenotypic features, but without an underlying diagnosis, suggests that this condition is markedly underdiagnosed, uh, which may be a good clinical point, but it, it suggests a decision support tool that could be embedded, number one, but also another way of getting at, uh, at rare phenotypes in all of our databases. Peggy? Anyone else? We still have about three minutes. Well, this is, this Are we done? Really, I mean, I, I, I'm following up on Reed's comment and a little thread that's going on in the chat room. I, I, I think the um, eMERGE is, I hate to use the word uniquely, but eMERGE and resources that couple very large EMRs to extensive DNA and genotypes have the potential to discover oh, okay. pleiotropy um, of the type that you described, Reed. And I, oh, so oh, I think that that is an opportunity for us. I need uh, to fix this. Somebody else is talking over me. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that um, uh, I can't. Um, so it's, I, I would just reiterate the idea that, that uh, starting to think about what variants that have minor allele frequencies of 0.1 or 0.5 percent do in a general population is something that, that we are uh, well suited for and uh, ought to be a, a strongly considered as a focus. I have a question for Zach. I think if the selection of medical record vendors has already taken place, uh, revisiting that is going to be difficult, and I know you've spoken at times about these apps, which I, I don't know all the, uh, the technical details, but at Mayo we have an EMR like that, which is basically a G-centricity on which are uh, applied these apps, and we found it very useful, and I wonder whether you could comment on whether that being a solution to this uh, rather difficult problem. Or others in the room there. You're muted again, Zach. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can now. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Yes. So, good. So, uh, there's a two-part answer. I still believe that the app solution that I've talked about is a solution, and I, we can go along on that some other time, although we did have a webinar recently where we uh, told you more about that. Nonetheless, I actually believe the fundamental solution political, and here is a point nine, or emerge three, and that is, I think it would be an interesting thing of emerge participants and clinical leadership uh, uh, like see, understand how their leadership position can be improved by um, talking to their vendors as a group. And because I, I think otherwise, they, they don't really uh, understand the lost opportunity. And many of them are embracing this notion of uh, precision medicine that's driven by molecular characteristics, but they don't understand that uh, they're not driving their fundamental tools of decision support, aka the vendors uh, of electronic health record systems, to actually to that point. So I would argue strongly in favor of a meeting where we actually try to address this issue, not with the vendors, but with our clinical leadership. I put that maybe on an NIH to-do list and, and or, or possibility wish list. So I agree strongly, Zach, that, that nothing could be more productive, I think. In the, in the could you repeat the, the critical issue? Because <laughs> yeah. we were having trouble hearing yeah, you. Yeah, we you, got were a breaking, bit you were of, breaking up significantly, Zach. Yeah. But from what I gathered, uh, Zach is suggesting that we assemble uh, the clinical leaders of major academic and perhaps non-academic medical centers uh, to meet 
and, and with uh, vendors so that the value proposition of treating clinical data as a primary resource can be articulated and can be shared and impressed upon the vendors. And, and we would be in a very different world if we weren't shadow boxing with our electronic medical records, as many of us are, uh, trying to uh, sort of squeeze data out of that gun. OK, well, that, that's been a very. Uh, Chris, can you hear me better now? Yes, yes, we can. Can you hear me? OK, so it's actually, uh, Chris, I appreciate uh, you trying to uh, channel me, and you almost had it right. What I was suggesting is not that we meet with the electronic, that our clinical leaders meet with electronic health records vendors. I was suggesting that we, the leadership of Emerge, clinical leaders, of leading institutions and explain to them why and what they should be demanding of the electronic health record vendors. I don't think they even understand that right now. Important distinction. I'm suggesting exactly. a joint meeting between us and our clinical leaders. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an important distinction. And explain what they should be demanding of, of medical the medical record vendors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, oh, yes. Explaining the, the value uh, proposition. Terry, this, is, <coughs> this is Dan Roden. Terry, this is Dan Roden. It's, this sounds right. like an opportunity for the genomic medicine working group. We don't have enough. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so yes, so all I can say is I, I know for a fact that when you actually talk to the leadership of these clinical, large clinical <laughs> academic centers, they understand that this is a priority in terms of where they hope to go, and they don't understand how they have not made this a priority for their vendors. If they haven't closed that synapse, and I think by having them meet with us, their own leader, leaders in the same space, collectively in a, in a group workshop, we could make that abundantly clear and turn that into an, a collective action item for them. I, I agree. I think if you do meet with them, I think that's a great suggestion. It would be really important to also ask them what kind of issues are facing them first for implementation. What do they want to implement? So we're hearing from group health, they're not that interested in a lot of the pharmacogenetics that isn't really evidence-based right now. They're much more interested in highly penetrant things for implementation because they see that as something that's actionable right now. Um, so I think it's really important to understand what, what, what does the healthcare system want from genetics and in what order? What do they so see about So that's great. So instead of uh, making it into a browbeating session, we turn it into a what's important in this space and how, and how do we use our electronic health record systems to um, operationalize that. But we don't make it as a technical discussion. We make it what, how do we turn these priorities into decisions at the C-level suite. And I think if we had the right participants, it would be a high-profile meeting. It would be very interesting for all of us. And I think it really would move our agenda forward. And I think if we're interested in this, we can have a email discussion of who should be invited. Okay. Th this is the electronic comment here. One, 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 thing, one thing you haven't discussed, which I think also is important in this context, is the economics. Because for our medical center, and I think it's probably true for many, genetics and genomics is looked upon as a money loser. And so I think their incentivization on this topic is going to depend on painting an image for them about how in the future this is going to have financial and positive financial impacts. Well, I think it's an important message for us to hear by direction. If there is really no economic value, which I doubt is true, then we should hear it. Well, I'm just telling you based on our own experience of our medical center, and I think of many others so far, you know, supporting genetics and is basically money has been a money loser, primarily because there are procedures involved. Um, we're trying to work on this in some fashion to, you know, to at least, you know, we, we refer for, for uh, procedures, but we don't, we don't get the income from that. So I think there, you know, for many medical centers, this could potentially be an issue. Things may change uh, as more as insurance, but that's why you know the insurance is important in this context also because as they cover more and more genetic services, 
things could change a bit, but there are, there are not too many models out there where genetics is, is really a money-making business. Okay, so what we'll do is, uh, in order to uh, stay on, a, on the agenda, we, we actually have a clear recommendation out of this meeting about um, convening a forum to discuss these issues. So we'll uh, close the segment on uh, phenotypes and move on now to uh, the EMR and genomic discovery. And uh, for this topic, uh, the eMERGE presenter is Marilyn Ritchie. Marilyn, you uh, have the floor.